So uh, we're just running a few minutes over. So welcome everybody to this uh, Urology COVID uh, UCSF session on prostate MRI. Um, I'm really thrilled and honored to be invited and uh, allowed to help uh, chair this session. Um, so I wanna thank uh, UCSF in particular, um, but also Lindsay Hampson, um, who I met actually online uh, in, in similar circumstances uh, a few months ago. Uh, kindly introduced to us uh, by Declan Murphy uh, on his podcast. Uh, so um, I'd like to welcome our very esteemed panelists. Um, so we have uh, Matthew Cooperberg. Um, so for all the American urology residents out there, if you don't know Matt, I think you might have been living under a rock and it's time to come out of that rock. Uh, so Matt, uh, Professor of Urology at UCSF. Matt, thanks so much for making time to join us today. Really looking forward to your insights. Pleasure, thanks. Uh, we have um, uh, Professor Antonio uh, Westphalen, who has previously been at UCSF, but has just shifted up to UW in Seattle, um, and is the section chair there for abdominal radiology. So thanks, Antonio. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be Thank here. You. And the Thank associate, you, professor, <laughs> associate Professor Spencer Bear, uh, who is also a, a radiologist uh, specializing in abdominal imaging at UCSF. Um, Spencer, thanks also for uh, making time today. Uh, thank you for having me. No worries. And, and we have our, our uh, usual suspects uh, from the prostate MRI side of things, uh, Richard O'Sullivan, uh, who you probably won't be able to see, uh, but he'll be um, showing us the uh, beautiful images today uh, in terms of prostate MRI. Um, Richard has read thousands of uh, prostate MRIs, no doubt, like Antonio and Spencer. Um, and is our local expert uh, and our go-to person. So Richard, thanks for joining us again. Thanks for having me. Um, and Dr. Andrew Ryan uh, is a specialist uropathologist at Tissue Path, uh, which is a, a boutique uh, private urology service uh, that we, uh, most Victorian urologists actually use um, for their prostate cancer. So um, it's, it's always great to have Andrew joining us uh, and you'll see some beautiful oh. uh, pictorial uh, assessments of the prostate, uh, which, uh, as you'll see, and I'm sure you guys use as well, we'll find out, uh, is just a brilliant way to feedback uh, on the imaging that we see, uh, whether it be with uh, prostate MRI and so forth. So um, let's uh, get this underway. Um, I, I guess I should introduce myself as well. I'm Jeremy Grummet, uh, for those of you who haven't heard of me. Um, I'm a urologist uh, at, the, at Alfred Health. I'm Associate Professor at Monash University. Um, I'm also uh, on the EAU Prostate Cancer Guidelines panel. Uh, and finally, um, I'm a co-founder of an online educational resource called MRI Pro. Um, I just wanna point out that uh, this is a session uh, that is not related to or endorsed by uh, UCSF in terms of MRI Pro, but um, we will be providing some details for free access to some online uh, education uh, called MRI Sprint uh, at, the end, at the end of this session. Um, so uh, stay tuned so that you can uh, see how you can uh, obtain that free educational access. Now, this is a case-based uh, webinar um, and uh, we're already well into the hour. So let's uh, kick off with the first case. Hopefully we can get through four of them and there'll be plenty of uh, issues to discuss for each one of them. So um, without further ado, Richard, would you be happy to uh, start getting up the MRI images and I'll start to introduce that first case. Um, uh, welcome everybody. Um, this is the first case. Do you want to talk about him first or I just go straight to the images? Let me just, let me just set the scene. Um, so this is a 57 year old guy, um, PSA only slightly elevated at 4.4. Uh, we repeated it as we, as we always do just to make sure it was real. Um, and, uh, it was still elevated. So yeah, we went ahead and, uh, performed this prostate MRI. So we use a Siemens Skyra 3T MRI, um, all with a, a body coil, no endorectal coil. Uh, this is a complex slide, but it just shows how we set up. We do three plane T2, sagittal, axial, and coronal. And then we do axial diffusion wave imaging. This is the ADC, the high B value diffusion wave imaging. And we do the same thing in the sagittal plane, sagittal ADC, sagittal high B value. And then the DCE is this picture here. So just to make it a little less complicated, DCE meaning d dynamic contrast enhancement. Enhancement. So we, we that's a comp, that's a the color we use. I just call it the color because it's easier. Uh, is the uh, 
a group of early phase arterial phase, early phase enhancement that's overlaid over a T2 weight image. So you can see on the sagittal T2, we'll just go through a little bit of the anatomy. Uh, the axles are probably the easiest. The transition zone is the central part of the gland, which has got made up of multiple nodules, which can be either hypo or hyper intense. The great characteristic is a focal, well-defined capsule uh, that's black on the T2 weight images. The peripheral zone is more, uh, home, more inhomogeneous and uh, can be either bright or patchy and dark. We're looking for a focal abnormality. We try to look at the central zone as well. So there's the tr transition zone, peripheral zone, and the central zone is at the base. It's not very well organized, seen in this patient. We can see here is the central zone at the base posteriorly. On the saddles, it's here. And on the coronals, we see it here. This is the uh, seminal vesicles, which are again, not that well demonstrated in this particular patient here on the axials and on the sagittals. And this is the anterior fibrous stroma here. So what we look for is to try and find a focal signal abnormality, either in the transition zone or peripheral zone. And then we collate that with the diffusion wave imaging. So as we go through from base to apex, uh, bladder base here, uh, I'm looking for a focal signal abnormality. And the thing that catches my eye here is in the anterior peripheral zone at the right apex. We can see here measuring about 0.6 centimetres here on the coronals and here on the sagittals. Now, if I put those together with the, the axial T2 on the, on the uh, left, the AD on the right, in the middle, and the high B value, which we use a B value of 1400 on the far right. So if I link those, those together, we put those together, we can see that focal area of decreasing intensity demonstrates decreased signal intensity on ADC. I've got that measured out on our system about 400, but there's obvious increased signal intensity on high B value diffusion imaging. The high B value is the most useful uh, sequence. If we look on the sagittal images, the sagittal high B value diffusion imaging, if we collate the two of those, we can see it here quite clearly on the sagittal diffusion imaging. On the DC or the color, uh, we would expect that to be in this area. This, so this does not enhance following contrast. Uh, so I think there's a 0 0.6 centimetre pyrades for lesion in the anterior peripherals at the right apex without any definite extra capsule extension. Thank you, Richard. So I might just uh, open it up there for, for discussion. Um, just in terms of the actual imaging itself, Antonio, perhaps you first. Um, is there anything that Richard said so far that you do differently or that you would disagree with even? No, not disagree, and um, we used to do it different. As you see now, we don't. We for a while we used the rectal coil, uh, mostly because we were doing MR spectroscopic imaging, and and we needed the signal for that. We end up giving up on the MR spectroscopy when we shifted from a purely research environment to a clinical environment because we couldn't reproduce the results we had, meaning it works, but it works when done right. And done right is complicated and not feasible for large volume of cases. So because of that, we gave up on the rectal coil. Other places still do it, uh, we don't. And here really, we are not using it at all in Seattle. Um, the one thing that I don't do, but I, thinking about is actually getting sagittal views as well on the diffusion. We are limiting right now to the axial, um, but debating. But Richard, I agree with the, with the results. Okay, Richard, um, do you mind perhaps just putting the images back up on screen just so that uh, people who are watching can just sort of uh, really imprint in their brain the sort of series that we want to be focusing on. And while you're doing that, um, Spencer, what about you? Do you have anything different? Or I mean, I presume, or, or do you use the pyrad system or do you use a Likert scale? What, what's your nope. scoring system? We use the pyrad system. Um, I mean, everything, I mean, I, Antonio trained me, so everything he said, he said was, uh, you know, the way we do it at UCSF, you know, I train when we used to still do spectroscopy and using endorectal coil and that has been phased out, especially with the universal use of 3T magnets. Um, and again, looking at those the sagittal um, diffusion imaging, it's really they're really nice. So I think it, you know, especially they may be very helpful. Um, but yeah, I definitely agree with pyrad for lesion. I mean, what are, what are, what are make a comment if I can, just to start you know, throwing things out there. So the history in this guy is active surveillance, right? 
Um, uh, not yet. Well, it, but that's that's where we're going with this. But, All right, uh, I'll, but stop. I'll stop. I'll stop. Quiet. For the for, the, for this main, mainly your logical training audience, uh, yep. if one of you can comment on the the differences between the ADC and the high B mode diffusion weighting, that's a subtlety that might be lost on some folks watching. Um, yep. And one of you will explain it much better than I will. So. Yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, Richard, are you happy to just sort of uh, go over that? As well? I think that's really it's, um, it's really variations of the same theme with an inversion of the of the grayscale. Uh, the uh, the ADC uh, is the one that looks like a poor value T2 weight image. It's the one I'm scrolling through at the moment. So the, the urine uh, in the bladder is bright like it is on an axial T2 weight images. Uh, and it's really a, a subtraction image from a high B value from a low B value to get a, it's supposed to eliminate some of the effects of, of uh, T2 and have more diffusion only in it. Uh, so if we do, if we do, uh, we acquire these. I think it's a 50, 400, 800 B value to get the ADC, and then we we get a higher one again, which is the B value of 1400, which is the one I'm scrolling through on the right now, the bottom right hand corner, which is really more the uh, pure diffusion. So it is a little bit difficult to understand, but it, the easiest way is they're both looking at mo mo movement of water protons and proton density, uh, and uh, and one has an in inversion scale compared to the other. So I use the analogy if it's black and white, so black on the ADC is abnormal and white on the high B value is abnormal. It's yep. the colours of a local football team here, which most people just <laughs> like. So that's easy for us to remember. I'll make a comment here too, because I hear this from your odds a lot. So first, uh, pretty much all the MR scans that we do in any part of the body are multi-parametric. That only means that there are several sequences that we do. T1 is one parameter, T2 is another one, diffusion another one, and anything else that you can imagine is another one. So that's the first thing. Uh, it's a fancy name that means MRI. Um, the other thing to, to just to, to complement what Richard said is that now dark on the ADC is abnormal and bright on the DWI is abnormal when they come together. So that's an important thing. You have to always look at them together um, because you can sometimes see things that don't, no, they're not, uh, the, they're opposed to each other, right? So you can have bright, bright and dark, dark. That's not necessarily what you're looking for. Right. And then the so, last thing, when people talk about high B value, the only thing that radiologists really care when talking about high B value is contrast. It increases the contrast between normal and abnormal. Yep, yep. So the, back, um, the background, the higher the B value, the more the background fades away and the more the tumor becomes more obvious. So that's what uh, Antonio was saying. We actually often run it as a B value of 2000 as well, which is offers marginal increased in, uh, performance, I think. So uh, Matt, as a, the only other urologist on, on the, on the uh, webinar, <laughs> I want to throw to you because um, obviously there's a lot of uh, technical discussion going on, but given that this is really mainly focused at urology residents, when you look at an MRI, what, seri what series do you look at to, to go straight to the, the answer? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, mostly, frankly, what I'm looking at is it's, it's usually either for a pre-biopsy sort of cognitive infusion or, or we have an actual urinav exam, but we still want to look at the exam in advance. So we know there's a lesion there. Um, the T2, I still find best for some anatomic identification of lesions. And then I usually think about the, the diffusion weighting sequences and the ADC as kind of verification if, if it's not clear for some reason, uh, which of a couple candidate spots on the T2 we should be focusing on, then I'll look at the diffusion. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think the, uh, the T2 has the most anatomic information in it. Right, right. So then, again, from our standpoint, I'm usually not looking at a high reds one, right? I mean, usually there's already an answer there by the time it's, it's coming to my attention. Right, right. Fair enough. Um, I, I guess for myself, just briefly, uh, I would almost flip it in, in as much as what I've found is that I'll focus first. Uh, and again, this is coming from a urologist, not a radiologist, but just so that you guys see how, how we view it. Um, I'll look at the DWIs and the, uh, the ADC map and the high B values first, look for the black and white and the, the opposing, uh, and then go for that confirmation with the T2 um, for, for, the, for those positive lesions. It doesn't really matter. It's just as long as all three line up and there's a lesion there. That's, that's really how you work out whether it, uh, you've got a positive or negative MRI. Now, it's all on the high B. 
the high B value is the most important sequence. Yep. Um, okay, we better keep moving because uh, we'll try and get through some some good teaching points here. Um, so yeah, Antonio, to your point, uh, we're, we're coming to that in just a moment. But because there was a lesion there that, that Richard pointed out, I went ahead and did what I would normally do as the next step, uh, which is a transperineal biopsy, uh, and that included targeted cause and template cause. So Andrew Ryan, if you're happy to just uh, show the report of that. Yep, sure. So that should be up on your screen now. I'm just waiting for it to convert. Did that convert to a presentation? Uh, um, presentation. So, yeah, presentation mode. Good. Uh, so there, uh, as you say, the, the template, right anterior, left anterior, mids and posterior, as well as target site. Um, and so corresponding to the MRI lesion, there's a three, a, a three millimetres of pattern three plus three. Um, and then the target lesion has a small percentage pattern four. So you can see on the right hand side, dominantly asinine um, uh, formations, but small numbers of poorly formed glands. So thanks, Andrew. Um, Matt, based on this information, right, you got a tiny volume of pattern four there. Uh, well, first of all, I'd be interested to know if your pathologists report percentages um, of Gleason patterns. Um, but in this particular case, uh, given the tiny amount of pattern four present, what would you be thinking about where to go next with this guy? Yeah, I mean, a couple of comments. First of all, you know, the PSA, first of all, is actually quite high for his age. Um, and I'm not sure the prostate volume here, but it did not look to be large enough to drive his PSA density down to a level that would be reassuring. So and you made a comment that because there was a lesion, you did a biopsy. I would have, you know, if you run the PCPT calculator on this gentleman, he's probably got a high enough risk of cancer to merit workup regardless of MRI. We're using a lot of liquid markers as well, you know, urine yep. and blood tests to try to make these decisions. So assuming he had a marker, you know, suggested a biopsy, we would have done, you know, a, a systematic biopsy plus minus MRI targeting. With this sort of pathology report, yes, we absolutely look at the, the percentage of pattern four, and we're also looking at subtypes of pattern four. So fused gland versus cribriform versus expensile cribriform, et cetera. Um, cases like this where we see, you know, 5% pattern four in a single core are actually the ones where pathologists will legitimately disagree with each other. We have all the external slides re-reviewed re by UCSF pathologists. But when, when we've looked at this in the Canary Consortium, for example, even subspecialized GU pathologists from academic institutions will disagree about calling these, especially the, the fused gland subtypes, whether it's a sectioning artifact versus a true pattern four. So a case like this, I, you know, at 56, if it's truly a pattern four, I will often tell him it's a question of when, not if you need intervention, but the when might be years and years in the future. Uh, and if he's leaning toward active surveillance, I think that's fine. It's a good argument for genomic testing when there is pattern four in a young man. Uh, but assuming that there were no other red flags here, we would offer him surveillance, understanding he's probably going to need something done, um, you know, before all is said and done. But I'd much rather have my prostate out at, you know, 65 than 55. And in 2019 than 2009. As, you know, as well, so. Right, right. When you say genomic testing, what, what exactly yeah. would you order? Yeah, we're using Decipher mostly at UCSF, mostly because we get the most information out of it. The other tests on the market here are the uh, Prolaris and Oncotype tests. Um, and they're all probably similar in terms of their performance characteristics. You know, there's the biggest literature now in uh, for Decipher. Um, they're all expensive, and I know they're all limited availability outside of the U.S., um, but their coverage is increasingly uh, good for insurance in the U.S., and I think they're very valuable for tiebreakers. We do not get them routinely on every lower case. It's not mandatory to get on surveillance by any means. Uh, and if we had the same pathology report in a 78-year-old, maybe we would not bother. But I think for a young man, it depends a little bit on his anxiety level too. If you were clearly preferring surveillance anyway, we might not bother. But I think a, you know, young, a, a man in his 50s with 3 plus 4 is a good argument to make sure we're not missing some bad biology. Right, right. Can I just, I completely agree with what you've said there, Matt. And actually part of our system is that all of our biopsies get looked at by two pathologists. So, you know, that's everything, not just these uh, these ones. So there has to be an agreement. And if there's a disagreement, it gets looked at by a third pathologist. But, but I fully recognise what you're saying here, that these low percentage pattern fours have disagreement. And, and just for the residents' sake on, on the call, it, it is legitimately incredibly difficult and subjective. You know, in, in some cases, you're looking at three glands. You know, if they're sectioned at a funny angle, it can, you know, the, the tip of a gland can look like a fused 
land and it's it, it is legitimately very difficult to make these look the other part that you've just mentioned there that's going to be good is that we're, we're more and more we're starting to recognize that as you've discussed large crew reform introductory type patterns are the bad pattern fours and there's less intra observer variation with those patterns we are better at actually getting uh at, at recognizing those with um with consensus what do you think about this argument? Uh, this is uh, Jesse McKinney and others that these that the fused plan subtype we really should not be thinking about is so different from pattern three in the first place. You know, from uh, uh, well, I think as as you say, once you start teasing out the bad pattern fours, the 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 lesser there are lesser patterns three, and particularly in the lower percentage patterns, maybe they do perform a little bit more like the three plus threes. So, uh, you know, we're certainly mentioning crib reform and large, large crib reform pattern as a separate pattern for now. We make mention of it in our reports. All right. So, so Matt, you've, you've mentioned uh, the use of uh, genomics for uh, tiebreaker type situations. Um, this guy, we, we don't have uh, very uh, good access to that in Australia. So um, I just put to this guy uh, the options of treatment or active surveillance. He chose active surveillance. That was two years ago. Um, about a year later, his PSA was about the same, a little bit lower, in fact, 3.8. Um, but because more than 12 months had passed, I ordered another MRI. We don't need to see that because there was essentially zero change. It was exactly the same. Um, and so he now continues on active surveillance. I did not repeat a biopsy because his PSA has been level and no change on imaging. Um, Matt, would you do anything different, I guess, aside from the, the, uh, uh, utility of genomics that you've already mentioned. Anything you do differently in in terms of an active surveillance, given the upfront uh, information we already have? No, in in this case, probably exactly the same. You know, we are really trying more and more to tailor our active surveillance protocols. We actually just had a study out from Canary and UCSF and, and Gem Oncology trying to do exactly this. And for men who have really reassuring, you know, not even a little bit of pattern four and stable PSA and things, uh, we're trying to stretch out the intervals, you know, longer and longer. Um, you know, this guy again, 50s with even a suspicion of pattern four, I probably would repeat a biopsy at two years, even if everything else looked good, uh, even if the MRR were stable, just to get two points in time and make sure we were not missing anything. And then after that, we try to stretch out more right. and more. Yep. Um, but again, the 50 year olds with the three plus four are the ones where, I mean, it, it's a subset of these guys and it's much smaller than 50%. I mean, you know, 5% of them will actually progress quickly and we want to make sure we don't miss those because we have seen them. Um, yep. Yep, yep. But on the flip side, these guys who can, are the ones who can actually benefit most from active surveillance, can't they, in terms of preservation of their you know, sexual function, et cetera? Absolutely. All right. Let's, I, thank want, you. I want to make a comment just for... Use, um, Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, do you use PSMA PET? Can I say it again? Do you use PSMA PET? Uh, for active surveillance? Yeah, it's not uncommon here uh, for... Uh, cool. Well, PSMA is not uncommon there, period. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, actually, it's not uncommon there. <laughs> so I'm told, you know, Tom Hope at UCSF has been spearheading this, this effort for the country, together with Jeremy Calais. So I am told we are two months away, give or take, from an FDA approval for the test, at which point it will be much easier to get insurance coverage for it and it will become broad, more broadly available. But it's been... Uh, it's been an access challenge in the U.S. Um, and I think it's used very sparsely for local staging. We do some PSMA PET MR fusion here, mostly for higher grade tumors. We're not really using it in active surveillance. Um, we are, we do still have an open protocol in MRI spectroscopy based on hyperpolarized carbon-13. Antonio alluded to this. I, I think it's actually very exciting modality, but we still only have a dozen or so cases, so a little bit premature. But I want to make a comment about pyrads. Um, people <laughs> talk a lot about pyrads and, um, and before I say anything, pyrads was a good thing. It standardized a lot of the things we needed to standardize and disseminate a prostate. Now, pyrads is work in progress. It can be better. And I think one of the important things to keep in mind is that um, a pyrads 4 is not necessarily the same as another pyrads 4. Um, and just to make it simple, it's based a lot on the size of the lesion. So a, a four millimeter finding could be a pyrads four, and then a 1.4 centimeter finding can be a pyrads four. So some people in Europe are using um, a different scale to, to look at active surveillance, and that's how I forgot, precise. And basically looking at stability of size and of features, of suspicion features between the two studies. So it doesn't mean that you cannot use the pyrads, but potentially should incorporate additional information to that. 
you comment on your study that just came out, Antonio, the one from radiology a few months ago, looking at pyrides across centers. Yeah, there's a lot of variability, and uh, but I think the, the the point is we can make it better, and it's not only in, no MRI, it's no MR, it's pathology, it's urology. I think we all have to work together, and that's why we are here right now. Exactly. Uh, if we do work together, we make everything better, and uh, in the end, our patients uh, get the better care they can. So. That sounds like the biggest message, because Matt, you mentioned it before about patent four. If, the, if, if our audience is urology residents, that to know that radiology and pathology is a subjective assessment of visual information, not to take it as black and, black and white, to know your pathologist, to know your radiologist, mm -hmm. to show it around if it doesn't make clinical sense. Yeah. No, I think that's a that's a critically important message. In fact, I hope this next case demonstrates the utility of that because, you know, and I'm sure you guys do the same, but like I reckon it's been what six or so years, Andrew and Richard, that we've been doing a really a prostate MRI focused MDT, um, and with the sort of pathology that uh, Andrew will show you in a minute that can then feed back on the imaging, you know, the the, the potential for learning there is uh, is very high. So let's let's move on to that next case so we can actually hopefully demonstrate that. So this is a um, uh, Richard, if you could get the imaging up if you don't mind. Um, this is a 72 year old man. Uh, PSA 7.3 uh, and a subsequent MRI. Uh, again, this is a small volume prostate, 25 cc. This is quite a difficult case, I think. Um, this is the actual T2, the top right hand corner, the uh, ADC uh, in the bo bottom left hand corner, and the bottom right hand corner, the high B value. So I've linked these, and if we scroll through them together from base to apex, you can see there's a little bit of asymmetry in the transition in the peripheral zone. It's slightly darker on the left than the right, really the whole way. And the ADC is only minimally darker on the left compared to the right. It's slightly darker on the left and so, uh, in the, on the ADC and it's slightly hyper intense on the uh, high B value. So almost a pyrad three. We looked at the, at the, this is the DCE and you can see on the DCE there's marked asymmetry in the contrast enhancement. Now, what we do this two ways. We do this as the combined image of multiple subtracted images laid onto a, a T2. If you look at just the subtracted images, these are the first pass images, you can see this is really very focally enhancing, uh, corresponding to that area of subtle ADC abnormality. So to me, this is a tiebreaker, shaking it from a pyrads three to a pyrads four. It's actually a, over about 1.5 centimeters, I've got it measured actually over 1.8 centimeters. So you could argue with this is a pyrads five, but it doesn't really go black and dark and black enough on the ADC or high enough. But you'll also see there's irregular capsule, the capsular irregularities, which is for early extra capsular extension at the left base. So I think this is a pyrads four, arguably a pyrades five with extra capsular extension, uh, left, left base to the mid prostate. Thank you, Richard. If you're, if you're saying that there's irregularity and, and therefore likely extra prosthetic extension, doesn't that automatically make it a Pyrates 5 though? Extra capsular extension is quite typical on MRI. When it's, when it's very obvious, it's very obvious. Uh, a little bit of capsular irregularity is a, a bit subjective and difficult. Um, uh, and on the pictures below that, it really doesn't look all that abnormal. So yes, it's sure, but I'm not completely sure that's extra capsular extension, but I'm certainly suspicious of it. Spencer, um, if I can ask you, uh, just looking at these images, and Richard sort of really, I guess, highlighted the value there of, in this case, the de dynamic contrast enhancement. Have you got any thoughts on the use of that? And have you experimented with biparametric MRI, with, in other words, without the contrast? I mean, so you bring up, so it is something that we've, we've talked about, um, I think even before Antonio left, what is, what's the, the added benefit of the DCE. Um, I think for that it can be a help problem, definitely helpful on a problem solving when you're seeing these lesions that are not seen at a high B value, you know, that's sort of the tiebreaker for a, a, a Pyrads 3 versus Pyrads 4. Um, the other thing that uh, I noticed just anecdotally is sometimes you can use the just straight looking at the washout curves to sometimes looking back and finding these subtle small lesions that you can, sometimes, especially ones near the apex or right at the base, and sometimes they can help you key in on some subtle lesions. But 
in some cases like this, it's just they light, they light up very, very bright and it's almost exceptionally easy to find them on it. But I think more, those are farther and fewer between than the ones that show up in the high B value and ADC and T2. Right, yeah. Antonio, any comments on this case? I think it's one of the cases to illustrate, again, as Spencer said, it's not for all cases. Uh, this is a true positive, a truly positive abnormality. We Every once in a while we'll see enhancement that is a little bit earlier, but more indistinct. And 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 uh, those in many ways will be, now if you're a purist, a Pyrads purist, you end up upgrading pretty much all the Pyrads 3s that you see. And, and I think that's one of the, the issues with the subjectivity or the art of you know, being a radiologist. You have to know when you call it, when you sort of pretend you don't see it or, or don't value it because you now it basically say if I have earlier or contemporaneous enhancement, which to me makes no sense because contemporaneous is at the same time, therefore it's always going to be positive. Um, you have to, to play a little bit with it and, and again, no, it's work in progress. But I think this is a beautiful case. It's a very focal area of enhancement. This is a clearly positive DCE, which should upgrade this lesion. If this was a little bit more ill-defined, a little bit less conspicuous, probably I would have ignored it. Yeah, and I think that's the, that's the interesting point is that, uh, as you say, I, I would, I mean, again, coming as a urologist, but I would have done the same thing if I hadn't have uh, had a really good look at the DCE, then just looking at the very subtle differences on ADC map and uh, and the high B values, then you know that's that's very easy to miss. I would have, I would have thought. But anyway, uh, you ask about biparametric too. No yeah. common. No. Now, anytime you take information out, you get less information. That's no given. Um, so we should be careful. People talk about doing biparametric for everyone, uh, and the argument is because pyrads does not really, it doesn't affect pyrads. But I always like to remind people that MRI of the prostate is not pyrads, and pyrads is not MRI of the prostate. And this today will not be tomorrow. If we don't do it, we won't know what it can do. Mm -hmm. now, maybe there are things that are better. Um, but once you decide that you're not going to do it anymore, you don't have that information. Yep. And I think several studies have shown that there is value to it. You just have to use it appropriately. Anyone comment on uh, length of capsular contact as a criterion for ECE? I mean, this one, this one, at least as a urologist, I would have called this. And if I were doing surgery, I probably would go a little bit wider uh, in that area because I do, I do think that looks pretty concerning. But it, but there are there should seem to be some radiologists and not others that will really just measure the linear length of contact regardless of the capsular integrity on MR as an indicator of VCE. Right. Any, any comments? Yeah, so, thing, um, Richard, you go for it. We, um, it takes us about 35, 40 minutes of scanning time. We do about two and a half, three thousand 3,000 cases a year. And we bring the patients in an hour earlier. They all get a, an enema. So you can see this, the re rectal gas is a major problem for us, uh, or used to be until we gave patients an enema. Now it's re rarely a problem. We always put an IV in the patient and we always give them buscopam to, to stop bowel movement artifact. So if you're gonna put an IV in a patient anyway, I don't see any reason not to give them contrast unless they have an al al allergy to contrast. So to me, it's all part of the same thing. And then the capsule contact. So there are a few studies that showing that if you have more capsular contact, you're more likely to have capsule involvement, which makes sense. Now, the more it touches the capsule, more likely it will be invading it microscopically. And now the, the numbers vary a little bit from study to study, but now a ballpark is about 1.5 centimeters to two centimeter. So if there is now a, a fairly large amount of tumor touching now the border of the prostate, it's more likely that you know, there will be some extra prostatic, I mean, capsular involvement, not necessarily extra prostatic extension, but the capsular involvement, which I think for you guys will not really you know, avoid surgery. It was just going to get a little bit bigger margin probably. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yep. a question of how we handle the nerve preservation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, where it's located to that. Yeah, that's true. All right, so we have a positive MRI here. Um, we went ahead and then did a Transperineal biopsy with targeting and template cause. Andrew, 
Am I Oops, showing you? Sorry, sorry. The wrong one. Yep. Case two. So we move on to case two. So there is cause. Um, so he's got involvement in the anterior, um, up to nine millimetres, a three plus three, but all the business is back in the left posterior, including your target at the left posterior mid and base, and it's high percentage pattern four, up to 12 millimetres in multiple cores. Yep. And so I guess just really quickly, again, for the residents, uh, with regard to biopsy, um, our practice here is to always do a transperineal biopsy. Um, we do always perform both targeted and template cores. Um, I think the number of targeted cores is actually important. Um, studies have shown that if you're doing less than three per target, then uh, your accuracy can fall right away. So I had given that, well, we have the luxury of doing this under general anesthetic. Now you can do transperineal biopsy. Uh, it's been well shown now under local. We've been used to doing it under general for many years now. So we're still doing that for the time being, but it just means that there's no downside in taking really as many cores as you think are necessary to make as best as sure as best you can that you've really nailed that target. So it might be, for example, anywhere between three and six basically um, for the target. And then for the template, uh, if it's a small gland, it might be uh, as few as 18, but you know, if it's a really big gland, it might even be as many as 36. So that's just a, I guess, a, a bit of an in how we do uh, actual prostate biopsies. Um, I'm not using actually any uh, software to fuse uh, at the moment. I'm just using a brachytherapy grid um, and doing so-called cognitive fusion. How about you, Matt? What do you do? We are still, there are a few centers in the US that are enthusiastic about transperineal, mostly office-based. Uh, UCSF, we still do the vast majority transrectally, as some of your colleagues like to refer to transfecally. Um, the, uh, you know, our, our infection rate, frankly, has really hovered around 1% and has not been rising over the years. Uh, and there are reports of gel more urinary retention and other issues from the transperineal. But more to the point, you know, for the most part, that does still require a trip to the operating room um, and is, is just more of a production. So we do it for, uh, you know, repeat negative biopsies. We're trying to chase something down, but it's not become our go-to yet. We typically do a 14 core template uh, transrectally, so apex mid base and the anterior apex. I was going to mention for the last case that anterior apex has been part of our template for many years because Kessler Shinohara pointed this out you know, back in the early 2000s. So that's the most common type of missed biopsy from a standard full core template. Um, we use the Urina fusion system, which I think is fine. You know, the European Urology published both a systematic review and an actual RCT from a group in the Netherlands a couple years ago showing the cognitive versus uh, true fusion versus actual in-bore MRI guided um, are actually pretty much equivalent. So yeah. I think the point is knowing what you're looking at at the MR and, and knowing what you're looking at on the ultrasound. I was going to ask you if this lesion was visible on, on truss uh, because a lot of the MR, you know, especially the pyrus fours and fives, we can see on ultrasound. And I think that's even more true if you know what you're looking for based on the MR. And that's where the cognitive fusion is particularly powerful. Samir Tanasia showed that too, that if you see it on trust also, the positive predictive value for the pyrads is, is much higher. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, um, I think when the MRI has directed you to a lesion, you, you can many uh, on many occasions actually see it even just when you're doing the ultrasound. But I think without knowing where it is uh, prior because the MRI has shown you, I think uh, there's a lot more guesswork involved. But I, And I can't remember in this particular case whether I could see it on ultrasound. But um, as you can see on the pathology report, there's a lot of pattern four here. Um, pretty high volume, you know, 12 millimeters, 90% pattern four in that target. So based on that, and this moves on to staging. So Andrew, if you could unshare, I'll just share my screen. Now I know that, uh, I know that uh, you guys uh, was saying earlier on that you don't have uh, access to uh, PSMA PET, but just for the purposes of uh, showing you, uh, can you guys see my screen there? Mm -hmm. I'd like to scroll up a little bit. We are using it for high risk preoperative and post treatment. Yeah, not for active surveillance. <laughs> not for active surveillance, right, right. No. It's still, still under study protocols. <laughs> so, so this is an, an example of um, uh, PSMA PET, just uh, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, and we use it routinely now for staging here um, for the higher grade uh, cancers. So four plus three and above, we'll routinely pull out the PSMA PET. Um, we're very lucky in that we do have it very uh, readily accessible. So you can see all the normal uptake in the kidneys, liver, spleen, lacrimal, salivary glands, etc. And then in the urine, in the bladder. But really the highlight um, of this slide is the little spot you're seeing down here on the patient's left 
uh, which, which correlates perfectly uh, with the MRI in terms of location anatomically. And the other aspect of this is that, and I'm obviously only showing you one shot here, but there is no metastatic disease. So we, we know that this tumor has avidity within the primary, and this is quite helpful as well, um, because it gives us extra confidence that uh, there is no metastatic disease. So now it's by no means foolproof, but it's a whole lot uh, better than bone scan and CT. So uh, that's what we're doing at the moment. I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, tell you that this patient then as a result of that staging went on and I did a radical prostatectomy, including a pelvic lymph node dissection, which Andrew should be able to show us. You got that, Andrew? Yep. Am I on? Uh, there we go. So we're back to um, back to our screen here. So, sorry. There we go. So uh, this is, um, I'm going to go into just a, a minute to describe what I'm showing on the screen now. So this is a volumetric, um, pictorial volumetric picture that we uh, present with our prose report or synoptic report, mm -hmm. um, just showing where we, uh, where we find the tumour. So I'll just take a second to show um, from a, we have the, the specimens inked and then cut Serially cut in um, parasagittal uh, in the uh, sorry axial plane into multiple transverse slices, um, and then the apex and the base are then serially uh, sliced in the parasagittal plane to show the margins at the apex and the base. So we end up with a specimen that looks like this. Um, some places will use whole mount um, uh, to show the ho the whole transverse slice. We only use the quarter thing, uh, the quarter blocks um, find that the processing is um, much quicker that way. Uh, we end up, so we end up with these quadrants. Um, we mark the tumour on the slides as we go. Um, and then uh, we have scientific staff who reconstruct that picture back into what we're showing here. So the surgeon gets a, um, a calculated tumour volume of index is in orange and all other tumour foci is in, uh, are in black. Um, and that's also, uh, Jeremy, you can speak to this, that it's, it's useful for you guys, but also useful to show the, the patients. Um, but then uh, we've been doing this now for probably 15 years. It's become very useful for the MRI correlation. Yeah. Um, yeah. We mark a couple of other things as well, extra, extra prostatic extension and seminal vesicle involvement are seen up here at the base. So, so yep, that's the general. Just a and tiny, then, oh, yeah, yeah, no, you carry yeah. on, Andrew, you finish off and then I'll... Uh... But in yeah, so so for this gentleman, um, his uh, le this is a, a left-sided lesion correlates beautifully with the MRI as we've seen. Um, just touching down at the apex, but extending in the mid gland and up into the base, and he's got some seminal vesicle involvement on that left-hand side, and very focal extra um, prostatic extension up at the base, but interestingly not in that area that we were looking at on the MRI, and that's uh, four plus three uh, corresponding to the biopsies. Um, other tumor foci are lower grade, three plus three and three plus four, um, and Jeremy, you did nodes at the same time, um, and there was no involvement, no nodal involvement. Thank you, Andrew. And this, this sort of, I guess, leads into a, a little discussion about seminal vesicle involvement. Now, ad admittedly, there's only a, a tiny bit of involvement here that's seen in the, the pale blue there um, on, the, on the screen. You can't actually, I don't think you, you have any uh, close-ups of that. That's fine. But Richard, I guess, going back to the MRI, there was no commentary about seminal ves vesicle involvement. But presumably, you wouldn't, there's no way you'd be able to ex expect it to be able to see SVI in this particular case, um, if it's only just touching the base of the SVs, is that is, would that be fair to say? It's a little bit of like, like extra capsular extension. I mean, most extra capsular extension in a radial sense is one to two millimeters, so it's actually quite hard for us to. It's where we are. We, we can't. We haven't got enough spatial resolution to do that. Yep. Uh, if I just go to the share screen just for one moment, uh, uh, I didn't call this preoperatively, uh, but. There is a little bit of focal contrast enhancement up here in the left seminal vesicle, but uh, that's too small for us to call on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. Antonio, have you got any comments about... I would uh, have called it clearly. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 I, I, no, I agree. I, I think it's, a, it's very difficult. When we see it, we see it. Most of the times we don't. And the one thing that I that I try to remember when I'm looking at these cases, if the tumor is at the base and there's quite a bit of tumor at the base, I look at the seminal vasculars two or three times just to be sure that I'm not missing anything. Uh, but I, I, it's, it's very, very difficult. 
And, and those little bits are, I would say, impossible, to be honest. Yeah. Matt, if you did see uh, likely uh, seminal vesicle involvement on an MRI, would you, would you like actually biopsy that area, like make a decision, okay, I'm going to include that in my biopsy, or would you just uh, go for the, you know, the prostatic primary? No, we do. If there's suspicion on pre-op imaging, we will biopsy the SVs. And actually in, in uh, salvage cases or, you know, potential salvage cases, post-radiation, we biopsy them routinely uh, because it's very important information for, for management. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's important for the urologists that are listening to know that when we call it, it's because we actually saw something. It's, yeah. It is a more positive result, let's say. When it's, now, if we, do, if we do say we're worried about it, no, it should be taken no. That's probably there. Yeah, the other point about SVI is, of course, it can happen three ways, right? The cancer can crawl just sort of up the ejaculatory duct into the seminal vesicle, which is what it looks like sort of happened here, versus it can grow, you know, so far outside of the capsule that it has now gone into the outside of the SV, or it can actually metastasize to the SV. And that's kind of an increasing order of severity and, and prognostic concern. And, you know, and it's important to keep that in mind because we, we need to manage them. T management should be a little bit tailored in terms of do you think about adjuvant radiation and what the threshold is to right. bend more treatment. Yep. But Absolutely. also say too, I mean, clearly in this case, uh, the staging from the MR was very helpful because you obviously went a little bit wider in terms of your, your nerve sparing. You can see that on the pathology specimen and you know, probably would not have had a negative margin had you gone as, as close. Um, right. I think it just demonstrates the value of, of MR for staging. Yeah, We've had a couple of cases where the abnormality is only in the central vesicles, abnormal diffusion, contrasting argument, and T2, nothing in the prostate. Uh, and at PATH, when the, at the radical, it has been direct extension. It's just the primary in the prostate has been too small for us to see. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm happy to report this guy. Uh, I did his prostate about two and a half years ago. His PSA is still undetectable, which yeah. I guess um, also points to the value of uh, PSA heading in staging. Mm -hmm. Um, which is very helpful. Now, I'm very mindful of time. We've only got less than 10 minutes left, guys. So what I'd like to do is actually skip to case four, Richard, because case three is pretty involved. Um, and hopefully we'll get to do we'll that. We'll go more. to the last case. Yeah, final case. I just comment for the audience too. A couple of people have used the Q&A, but if people have questions that are not using it, feel free to use the Q&A as we... Right. As we we've had a, we've had a, a trickle uh, come in. Thank you for fielding those guys. So this next, this final case uh, is a man in his uh, 50s again, or no, sorry, early 60s, um, who had a PSA of 8.4. Um, now, actually, this is just while, uh, Richard, you're getting the images up. Um, Matt, do you use... Uh, in addition to P PSA, I know you've talked about genomics for, for more complex cases, but do you use the basics like free to total ratio or do you use prostate health index or do you use the 4K score? We're, we're using a little bit of all of them. Uh, I noticed you had a phi on the last uh, on the last case. We're using, actually these days we're using a lot of XODX because it's now a home urine kit. So we can save the patient a trip to the healthcare environment under the sort of pandemic. We've done a fair amount of select MDX and 4K. Uh, we've used... PHI, but less than 4K, because one of the things I like about the 4K is it integrates the clinical information and the, the report is a little bit more actionable in terms of the percent likelihood of, of high grade disease, as opposed to the, the phi score, which is just sort of a number in isolation. But we have used, we, we use these markers pretty extensively because the, the paradigm we're really trying to build at UCSF, and we're doing this with primary care here, is particularly for men in their 40s and 50s, you know, advocate for early testing with a low baseline, like the, you know, the baseline at 50 should be about 0 0.8 is the median. So, you know, a relatively low threshold, way under four for men in his 50s or early 60s merits consideration of evaluation. That doesn't mean biopsy. That means secondary markers, MRI, et cetera. Yep. 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 So we, yeah, uh, so we don't really have access to, to many of those markers, but we do have some access to prostate health index. So yep. in addition to this guy having a PSO of 8.4, he had a, you know, really quite a high PHI of 94. Um, now, you know, if, it depends on what your cutoff is, but if you, if you say a, a cutoff is 45 or thereabouts for PHI, then 94 is obviously uh, well, well in excess of that. So, uh, Richard, have you been able to get the MRI? Well, it's coming up. You mentioned free to total, which still does have some value, as does uh, PSA density, incidentally, especially for older men. So, that, yeah, and we'll, we'll, that's exactly what this case is hopefully going to demonstrate for us. So. So uh, um, on that 
high MRI. Richard, is this case four? Yeah, this is kind of a warning case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, prostate volume is 45 cc. If you look at the actual T2, the top right hand corner, I'm, I call this the dirty peripheral zone. So the peripheral zone is ISO intense to the transition zone. So that means it can hide abnormality within it. If we go from uh, base, uh, oops, sorry, I'll put that link, but I'll just link them briefly now. If we go from base to apex, you can see that the peripheral zone throughout is only slightly dark on the ADC, bilaterally and symmetrically, and slightly bright on the high B value, bilaterally and symmetrically. If we go to the uh, DCE, nothing focal. If we go to the subtracted images, nothing focal. So I would call this a PIRADS 2, but I'm nervous in this, what I call dirty peripheral zone. So um, you, you mentioned PSA density, uh, Matt, which is a perfect segue into this case because, uh, you know, here, we, here we've got a, a tricky MRI because of that um, ISO intensity uh, and a high PSA density. It's about, it's, it's almost 20% here. Um, so even though you had a negative MRI, I went ahead and did a biopsy on this guy. Um, and so I think, Andrew, you might have the results there. Yep. This is case four. Yep. Uh, Sorry, I've just lost my little um, my tab. How do I do that? Uh, zoom. Uh, yep, I think I'm right now. Yep, looking good. Yep, good. Uh, so that is, I won't muck around too much, but that is, um, I can't get it any bigger. So he's got uh, 12, 12 site um, template biopsies um, up to, is at 10% pattern for uh, the right mid, but he's got bilateral foci, most of them small, maximum four millimetres. Oh, it's interesting. This, this is positive for significant cancer in multiple different locations. A very uh, small foci, unfortunately. Very small foci and only up to a maximum of 10% pattern four. So uh, this was an interesting one. I'll be, I'll be really interested to hear what your thoughts are on this. Uh, Matt, actually, just from a urological case management point of view, you've got, again, uh, now, now this guy's, uh, how old was he? Was he, uh, set, I'm just trying to remember his age now. It's, I've lost the, um, that sheet. I think he was about 70, actually. Um, but he's got a relatively he's younger. Low younger, he's uh, 60, uh, 65. No, uh, yeah, 65. 65, okay. But, um, so he's got widespread but low ish grade prostate cancer with only a tiny amount of, of pattern four. I presume this is where you'd bring in your genomics, yeah? Yeah, I mean, well, look, first of all, I think it's a perfect illustration of the fact that, you know, in, in our practice, MRI is a fantastic adjunct for, but not replacement for biopsy. And, you know, you look at the PROMIS trial, uh, you know, the negative predictive value for Gleason grade group two or higher was only about 76%. You know, there is a significant miss rate in patients that have not yet had a biopsy. So, you know, and cases like this is a perfect example um, that, you know, the UK paradigm of, you know, elevated PSA, MRI, only biopsy if MRI positive. I don't think we're quite ready for that in prime time 2020. Uh, as far as what we do with this diagnosis, this is fairly diffuse pattern four. Um, again, if the patient were motivated for surveillance, um, I think, you know, Yes, great, great case for biomarker. But the PSA density is high, 0 0.2 or higher, something like that. Um, this is probably not somebody that's going to get 10 years on surveillance, but if he wants to try to buy some time, I would say marker is very reasonable. But obviously, we can't follow it with imaging. Um, and, you know, the question, the, the tricky thing with cases like this becomes, what's going to be the trigger for intervention if it's not now? Right, so we're not really going to look for increased volume of disease that's already diffuse. Uh, we can look for increasing percentage of pattern four but we don't really have an actionable threshold there. So cases like this, I think, are, are tricky in terms of launching down the surveillance path because we don't really know what's going to be our warning flag to, to make a different treatment decision down the road. Uh, yep. But again, if the genomics were favorable, I wouldn't say no. Yep, yep, no, that's good. If the density is concerning. All things being equal, this is one of these men I would tell, all things being equal, I think I'd, I'd recommend treatment, but we wouldn't say no for surveillance. Yep. Going back to your original comment at the start of the presentation as well, Matt, um, 
the, the smaller the, the focus, the more intra-observer variability amongst that pattern four as well. That's, that's something to note. Mm -hmm. But here you called it everyone, right? Every core had a little bit of pattern. Every core, but small percent, yeah, small amount of it. But, and in, I think one of them, the 10% was 0 0.5 millimeter focus, so. Mm -hmm. The other thing too is uh, Matt and I were in a lecture a few years ago and one of the patients said, oh, what, what do you mean by negative MR, right? What does that mean? Is that indeed negative? Is a true negative? Is it a obvious tumor that was missed? Is it a mimic? Or it's something that is inconspicuous that in retrospect you can see. And I try to you know, tell fellows and residents that now MR is not the only thing that your odds will look at and the very least look at the PSA density and, and tailor your interpretation to that. So when you have something like this guy here, this guy has cancer, right? Come on, like there's zero chance. If you're not seeing it, you should just look at it again uh, and find it. Um, so in cases like that, I probably would have called that positive. I would not have called it a, a pyrides too. Um, the question then is how do you going to, to, you know, to categorize it? You're gonna call it then a pyrides five or not? And I think then it's where radiology knowledge comes because when you look at, now I was lucky to actually be able to sit down with pathologists and look at several of those slides. And, and when you learn the concept of partial volume averaging and how images are formed, you realize that when tumors are more sparse and tumors are lower grade, they're gonna be less conspicuous on imaging. It doesn't mean that they're not seen, now that dirty gray is, you know, is often tumor. It's usually not a high grade tumor and it's not definitely a, no, a ball of tumor that's, no, that, that would be a Pirates 5, for instance. So something to keep in mind, um, and that's where, now again, partnership with the pathologist, the urologist and the radiation oncologist and the radiologist is crucial and the oncologist, hopefully not, but everyone's the one. Um, now it's crucial um, uh, to, to manage these, these cases appropriately. If you are, uh, as we do here, using MRI also as a triage test as to whether they, they do have biopsy. So and this is just really getting back to your comment, Matt, about whether you biopsy or not. We um, tend not actually to biopsy patients if, then, if their MRI is negative and if their PSA density and in, um, is low, um, so for example, less than 10%. Um, we have shown that um, the negative predictive value in, in that set is 91%. Now, obviously it's not 100%. So that means automatically you're missing 9%, right? So if a patient doesn't get a biopsy, they are not told to go home and forget about it. They're always brought back for further follow-up. And that usually is in the form of you know, PSA in say six months time, et cetera. But the point um, I want to reiterate, because you guys have already made it beautifully, is that uh, is to just be super careful of the negative MRI, especially when the PSA density is high, as it was in this case, nearly 20%. Um, and certainly if it's even higher than that, um, I, I would automatically go to biopsy um, in those cases, even if the MRI is called negative based on, you know, being sort of a, a pyrids purist. Yeah, I would call, so, I would call the radiologist just to check uh, in addition to... <laughs> <laughs> but the, yeah. the other and, thing um, Matt mentioned that it would be hard to use imaging to uh, to follow. I, I disagree a little bit because again, you no, know, uh, you you may not increase the size of the the thing because there's tumor everywhere, but you may have areas that become you know more conspicuous, you no, know, maybe more restricted diffusion, yeah. maybe you know, other features that you no know, will highlight. So imaging, if this patient were to go to active surveillance, image can potentially be helpful and help target you no. Know, uh, particular sites in the future. So, so Matt, because we don't have access to genomics, but we do have access to PSMA PET, and because this guy was so kind of borderline, I did a PSMA PET on this guy. Now, I don't actually have the, the image, unfortunately, but it was positive, right? So the, this is a classic example where the MRI is equivocal, perhaps, but the PSMA PET was positive, and the patient and I had been equivocating as to whether we uh, do active surveillance or whether we treat but because of that uh, PET scan, it was just enough to push us over the line. Now, I know that's not evidence-based, but it, well, it just made us both feel more comfortable that um, it was going to be the right thing to do. So I think, Andrew, perhaps to finish off, have you got the yep. uh, pathology on this guy? Sure. So this is, again, the, the volumetric picture that we presented, and he's got multifocal disease with the uh, index 
focus down in the right apex and um, up into the right mid on that posterior lateral quadrant um, with other foci on the left peripheral zone and um, up in the transition zone towards the base. Uh, so oh, we won't spend much time on that. That was just low power showing the focus, but his, that, that index focus three plus four, 20%. Um, with the other fo smaller foci, three plus three and three plus four, um, and the, all the foci were organ confined, margins negative. Thank you. So, um, are there any other comments that that anyone wants to to make on that case? I think we've I think we've really covered covered the bulk of it. Now yeah. it's it's uh, five past the hour, so um, I think it's it's time to wind up. Um, I would like to thank all of our panelists. Uh, for joining us, Antonio, Spencer, Andrew, Matthew, and Richard. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, making this such an interesting session. Um